I need to press record. <laughs> I think I'm recording. Yes, I am. Um, hi, um, it's Rachel. And this week I'm on the sofa with Amy Grinstead. She's a freelance content designer. Um, welcome, Amy. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Um, last time we spoke, um, you were telling me about some really interesting work that you've been doing, some design work for Action for Hearing Loss. And um, yeah, I just thought that sounded really interesting. So I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So um, from kind of about February time, which feels like so long ago now, it feels like a whole lifetime ago. Um, I was doing some work with um, yeah, Action on Hearing Loss, which is a UK charity for people who are um, deaf, um, which is deaf with a capital D, um, and who have um, hearing loss and tinnitus. Um, and they've basically been working on a redesign and moving to a new CMS for their website. Um, so yeah, I was working with them for about three, three and a half months um, on, on content design for that, basically. So that was really good, working with the content in UX team um, looking at a whole load of basically kind of the, the main journeys for people who you know maybe think that they have hearing loss or they're not sure um, you know what are the signs and then all kinds of information about hearing aids and hearing tests and things like that so um, yeah it was a really good project when I joined them they'd done a whole load of discovery kind of months of discovery and had a whole set of user needs worked out um, so I kind of joined from a kind of sketching point and um, kind of get getting going straight away from there which is really exciting so yeah, it was nice. It was a really good challenge. It was really good to um, lead some content crits with the whole team. Um, got to do some some testing as we went along and doing user interviews with um, people who volunteer with the charity um, or people who who have hearing loss and finding out, you know, what kind of information they find useful. Um, and obviously, while I was working with them, uh, coronavirus hit um, and everything kind of changed. So. Um, yeah, plans kind of changed for the new website um, and actually went live um, early with some beta pages um, mm. involving a coronavirus response, um, which it was, yeah, it was really interesting to work on that. And it was it was like a really busy kind of couple of weeks to get things turned around on that. And we had lots of information for, um, you know, people who might be having uh, having trouble with their hearing aids, but they couldn't go to their normal audiology mm. department because everything was kind of closed down for coronavirus. Mm. Um, so all these kinds of different things, you know, where people can go to get help during that. So that was a lot of the content that I was working on. Um, yeah, it was it was really good. It was a really good project to be to be involved with. And the site's gone live actually. So they're working on their MVP of the site, which is now live, um, and it's it's looking really good. That sounds yeah. great. What um. How do you test, like how do you do um, testing with people that might have, um, might have hearing difficulties or, or are deaf? Like is that, does that pre present whole new challenges? Yeah, so I um, I didn't do testing with anyone who uses um, BSL, which is British Sign Language, um, mm -hmm. as a first language, but other people in the team did. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think there were kind of challenges around, you know, um, they obviously needed um, an interpreter to to talk to you know backwards and forwards between the person mm. who had BSL, um, and it's really interesting because I I wasn't fully aware and and I'm really kind of grateful for the opportunity to learn more about um, being deaf with a with a big D as a culture and actually mm. having BSL as a first language. Um, it really opened my eyes to things like um, in the daily um, COVID briefings. Um, the, uh, England has only just got or I think maybe it's only one of the channels maybe BBC or someone has only just got um, yeah. BSL interpreters now where even all the you know the other nations in the UK all had them um, so there are definitely a lot of challenges for mm -hmm. making content accessible for people who have BSL as a first language um, so yeah it's something that the team were looking at quite a lot um, and you know how can we make how can we make this the best that we can um, I think some things are still um, in development or being looked at but you know um how can we make uh videos as easy as possible do we have things starting at a set time or do we match them up with certain headers of content on a page or things like that so yeah mm. it was really interesting to learn there was a lot of things to to consider um and just generally kind of what information is useful to people and you know obviously you want to make sure that we're answering people's questions and needs so mm. yeah it's like an anxious time for everybody but when you've got something like that like you were saying when people can't go to see a specialist if their hearing aids broken yeah or, you know, they're, they're even more anxious because what they're seeing on tv isn't giving them the information they need i mean half the time when you look at like automated 
um, sort of captioning and subtitling is not that accurate. So yeah, you know, t- that must be a huge anxiety for some people who don't have maybe yeah. people around them to tell them what's going on or explain what's happening. And especially where everyone's wearing face masks now um, and mm. people who are deaf or have hearing loss are really a lot of the time rely on lip reading. Um, so there are people who, um, and actual hearing loss have been retweeting a lot of these videos on Twitter, mm. um, people who are who are deaf or um, deaf people who work um, in the NHS who are teaching kind of basic sign, um, you know, signing for um, showing where it hurts or something like that or kind of basic mm. symptoms. Um, because yeah, it's a it's a really difficult time to to have a hearing loss or or be deaf right now with yeah so many kind of mouths covered up and it's really <laughs> difficult to communicate when you can't see what people are saying. Um, yeah, I was yeah. thinking that the other day actually because if I go to a shop or something, I wear a face mask and you know you kind of do that polite British thing where someone walks past and you're smiling at them or they say something and you smile back and I think do they know I'm smiling like they can't yeah <laughs> and they can tell I'm smiling at them or doing some sort of yeah. like hello gesture because yeah your half your face is covered up you just don't really think mm. about it until until it happens um because you know we're lucky enough not, not to have had to think about things like that but yeah it's like taking an extra sense away isn't it really for yeah no, that's a little little reading. Yeah, there's so many kind of nuances to communication within, yeah, half your face and yeah, which which obviously so many people rely on more than you ever think. But I think it's um like uh, one in 11 people has a has a type of hearing loss. So it's it's really common. Um, yeah. So it's yeah, they're doing some really good work around getting it addressed and trying to yeah make make um, more information accessible mm. to more people. So, and yeah. did it, how did going into a new team or a team of people that you haven't worked with before, particularly sort of during, during um, lockdown, and obviously you can't go and meet them and do some kind of ideation sessions together. How did you find that? Was that quite strange? So when I first started with them, actually it was before the lockdown and stuff, but I was okay. working remotely from them. So the team was working in London and I, I'm based in Southampton at the minute. Mm. Um, so I was working remotely from them and I was really lucky to be able to have a few days where I could go up and we could do some sketching together or um, even if I was up there for a sprint retro or something. Um, so it was, yeah, it was interesting at first actually that everyone was kind of working in one place and then I was working separately. Um, and that was my first kind of real time of prolonged remote working um Mm. but then obviously everyone went remote anyway um and that was actually quite nice because then it's I think like a lot of people have said it's a bit of a leveler it can feel a bit different maybe if you're the only one who's remote and you know everyone's standing around a table or standing around a whiteboard of post-it notes or something and um I mean the team was great when I was the only one remote you know people were like kind of showing me everything that was going on and and Mm. I I never felt out of it um Mm. but then when suddenly when everyone has to use a virtual whiteboard or something like that it it gets um yeah it's probably a more equal dynamic I guess but yeah yeah, it's been interesting everyone's been learning new ways of working I think it's it's strange isn't it because going into an established team where they all know each other and obviously see each other every day like you say it could it can feel quite it can feel quite like isolating or like you're on the edge of it but when you're all remote and you're all in that situation, it sort of takes away that strangeness and that feeling. of Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and did the project, how did the project push your content design skills or what did you kind of get the most from, from the project? So I think there are a few things. Um, one was that for the last kind of five or six or however many years I've been working agency side, mm. um, which I know that you've been doing recently as well, that you've, yeah. Yeah, you've just, you've changed. Um, so it's been nice to um, rather than having like a, a set amount of days or a certain amount of the time and then be kind of jumping mm. between clients or things like that. It was really nice to just kind of have, you know, be working in full full time for on one client and we're focused on one project. That was really, really nice. Mm. Um, and I think just partly it just made me like doing doing the work and when obviously with the coronavirus response things were going out really fast and we were measuring and um you know um seeing where things needed to be changed or what people were finding um useful and I think that that obviously sped up processes like I'm sure it did for a lot of companies um it definitely showed me the value of content design as a role um and how important it is you know people people need this information Mm. I think it's it's quite easy for um for businesses or for stakeholders or whoever to think that you know 
there's still an old fashioned attitude of content is like the last thing to be considered or, mm. you know, we'll do the design and then we'll put the words in. Yeah. Um, but now, and especially with the terrible messaging that we've had from the government and all sorts of things going on, like people are really starting to realize that people, um, you know, audiences and users need, need clear messaging, need to know what's happening, need to be told the right things mm. um, and need honesty in messaging and things like that as well. So, yeah working working through this time and working with a charity that's providing information and support to people yeah it's really shown me even more the importance and the value of content design as a role because it's it's vital and i think with that with that kind of project where you know it's um reacting to um sort of topical events and like you say making information readily available in a easy to understand format mm. that is you know that's that's content you know that it's all content it's all about content the content is the whole reason we're doing the project so it's not like someone saying oh let's just redesign this website and make it look prettier you know there's like which shouldn't happen anyway but often does and then the content's a bit of an afterthought it's actually the you know the genuinely the reason you're doing the whole thing is for the content so it's right that the content leads that process yeah and um kind of thinking about the the wider project the redesign um you know i think it was it was kind of well recognized within the team and probably the the wider company the wider organization as well that the website like like a lot of people sites are is quite internally focused or you know mm -hmm. there's kind of different sections or different departments or different silos and things like that but yeah. then actually looking and turning it around and making it user-centered and starting to work in that way um, and getting everyone across the business and across the organization on board as well um, that's something that they did really well like I've, I've never seen a team kind of get on so well with all the different subject matter experts and all the different people and all the different stakeholders so um, yeah it was it was a really good yeah, really good example of the fact that it can actually be done and people can do <laughs> really good discovery and, you know, people can can be on board and bring people on board for a project like this as well, which is really good. That's amazing. Yeah. Do, you think, do you think the um, stakeholders, stakeholders are so on board because they, um, they value um, the experts on the team and they understand that, you know, to get the right messages across, there's this team that will help them do that. Is that, is that, do you think why or is there another reason they're so collaborative yeah i think so i think that's part of it i think um they were the people the, the team the ux and the content team within action hearing loss as well they were good at bringing people along mm. um so you know kind of you're reviewing at the end of the sprint with them what we've done so far and people were always impressed to see that um you know i think they could actually i think they could really see how it was going to make their lives better and their lives easier mm -hmm. at work as well as the people that it's actually benefiting so you know the end users the people who have hearing loss problems i think they could really see how it was working how it was going to work for them as well which is really really good yeah that's so nice mm -hmm. it's so rewarding yeah. to be on a team like that as well where everybody is kind of on that journey together yeah it was it was yeah it was strangely nice it was really <laughs> <laughs> strangely yeah. refreshing <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was yeah <laughs> even though you were under pressure on a like tight timeline I think yeah that's, i think that's um, one of the good things about being agency side as well is that it gives you that experience of having like this very very short time frame to deliver something and having like a finite time because obviously mm. you've you know the client's been told it's going to be delivered in x number of days so um for you i guess like working to tight deadlines like that is is quite quite easy for you yeah it's quite nice and then um, you know the the sprints always kind of worked out quite well that it was nice to just have time to kind of sit and just crack on with writing and things like that and then make sure that i was kind of touching in with the team and we were you know kind of keeping on keeping on our timelines and everything and i'd say that most of the sprints ran ran quite well mm. um which yeah like cr full credit to the team it was it was it was really good um but yeah i think especially everyone's been kind of finding in lockdown and now that everyone's been kind of working from home like how they best work i think mm. so I, I feel like i've definitely found that i'm really good at kind of cracking on and writing and getting all of that out the way like in the morning and in the afternoon is maybe more for like kind of admin and emails and kind of bitty work and things yeah. like that um so i think probably everyone's been kind of seeing how they work and how they have to structure that around new things like homeschooling and things like that now yeah. as well as yeah <laughs> i think <laughs> mental, mental capacity as well like you start off the day with good intentions and then i know by about three o'clock in the afternoon especially if i've had lots of zoom calls 
my mind's just kind of turned to mush. So I have to almost do something else for a little while and then come back to something later on because mm. it's just, yeah, it's a bit mind numbing otherwise. I th- yeah. yeah, you're definitely right. Especially when it's so rhythm. hot as well. Oh, I know. It's really hot. <laughs> yeah. So In the what, afternoon, my brain just melts. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been doing to stay sane during lockdown? Obviously, you've got you've got cats there to keep you. Busy. Yeah, um, I think I must have ticked off about every single lockdown cliche. I think um, I've been <laughs> I've been baking sourdough bread like one shame. cliche. Yeah, definitely. We could do bin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been doing that. I've you know I've got a jigsaw on the go. I've been doing like Zoom like quizzes and games nights and stuff like that so um yeah I mean yeah so I'm only in a in a one bedroom flat so I'm kind of trying to go outside when I can do and I've mm. said to you that I sat out in the park for the first time today and it was just it felt really strange um <laughs> but yeah just trying to trying to break up I think the the working time and then the actual relaxing time and yeah. making sure I just walk between the small amount of rooms that I have in my flat to uh, <laughs> <laughs> shake it off when I need to. But I, I try and work from a different room like for some of the day I work from one room for some of the day I work from another so I don't get bored but the, I don't know I don't know like you I've found that being at home is really dangerous because you start seeing things you want to do around the house and I've like bought new furniture I'm thinking about the <laughs> bathroom because I'm now looking at it every day whereas before I was out every day I didn't really think yeah. about it. Now I'm looking at all the things that I hate about my place every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, you're shortly moving, aren't you? So um, yeah, well, so I yeah, I'm ready get, getting ready to move, which has been kind of a hassle on its own because I'm kind of like, oh, I need to pack everything, or I need to be getting rid of this or getting rid of that. And you're yeah. off to Copenhagen, aren't you? To take yeah, UX World by storm. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, I should have been there by now, but then coronavirus came along. Um, so my plans have all been pushed out a bit, which is annoying. But hopefully I'll be there in the next month or so. Um, but yeah, I've been kind of doing quite a bit of research into what um, I guess the state of content is like in kind of Copenhagen and Denmark as a whole. Mm. Um, and it seems like it's still a, a fairly low to middle kind of maturity level kind of speaking to people based out there Mm. um there seems to be a really healthy ux community which is great lots of ux designers and um and developers and engineers um and you know kind of all people like that thriving but i've been speaking to quite a few um people who do work in content in denmark and and there seems to be this kind of a little bit of maybe a lack of buy-in from kind of higher up or a bit of an, you know, lack of understanding about the value of content or things like that. Um, And I have kind of alerts coming in on, you know, different roles and and things like that for like this. I know that we've talked quite a bit about what the the job title is if you work in content design, whether you are a content designer or, you know, are you a a UX writer or, or should you be looking at roles for content strategists and, you know, or, or Mm. people still just calling them copywriters. Um, So I have alerts for some jobs and things coming in and some of them say things like head of content and then in brackets intern. And you're like, what is this? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) The highest internship ever. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's, it's a little bit crazy and a little bit mind numbing sometimes. So, um, yeah I'm I'm hoping to to try and start you know or, or find a community of, of content people over in in Copenhagen or, or wider in Denmark and hopefully we can kind of start to show the value of content a lot more um, but again I, I feel like with everything that's been going on with coronavirus um, and the need for clear messaging I think hopefully more and more organizations are starting to see the need and the value for for talking to people and listening to people and answering what people need and things like that but um yeah I think I think it's I think it's a good opportunity there and a good challenge definitely yeah definitely sounds like it I think you know particularly uh, like one of the signs of you know an immature d- discipline if you like is where people don't know what to call a job role they know mm. roughly that they want someone to do the content but they don't know enough about content to know what that role should be what sort of shape it should be um and you're right there's some kind of really random job roles out there and I think that you know that's fine that there's different I I agree that there are different like different like a need for different content roles Hmm. but the problem is is that people don't know what role they need so they just call it any old thing and yeah like you'd apply for it uh and it would be completely different to you know the role would be completely different to what the job title said um and you know it's fine that different companies need different types of 
content person there's different types of designer you know there's like multiple different levels levels and roles within design world and you know content will probably be the same at one point but at the moment it's just like content is just such a broad term almost too broad um so people are like oh what job title do i give it oh I'll just give it any other thing um so yeah it's quite tricky and um yeah. i think like i guess i guess what will be useful is is once you're there and you kind of are in that ux community is is starting to talk to different designers and product owners and people like that and sort of asking you know finding out who's doing their content at the moment <laughs> and yeah, you know, yeah sort of understanding like yeah where their skill gaps are I guess um yeah I mean from the people I've been talking to it seems like it is still kind of kind of that um what hopefully we'd like to think of as, as an old way of working of you know really silo department so this mm. is the digital department and this is the comms department and then this is the you know the marketing department or something like that and it um I think they're starting to realize that they need to bridge across them but it just hasn't happened yet or you know they yeah. haven't really had the the need to do it yet which is a good time for you to go and take them by storm and organize a few meetups <laughs> go and shake it up a bit <laughs> definitely um will you still pop over to events and conferences in the UK I'm sure once you're there yeah i'm hoping to if um if air travel is part of the new normal then um yeah i'd like to be able to come back obviously my um my fr family and friends and everything are over here so mm. it's, it would be nice to, to come back and visit when i can do and yeah especially the there are so many good conferences popping up all the time and i know obviously mm. we had you're going to have um content by design this year which yeah sadly next year, next year. And, yeah but yeah i mean all sorts of things happening so yeah i definitely like to to keep coming back for them that would be awesome well we've still got a safe comp happening next month mm. so there'll be a few few small kind of content talks to for everybody's appetite for next year but it's very sad we didn't get to hang out at confab i know yeah could have been hanging out at confab earlier the, earlier in the month um but we did it virtually didn't we oh did you um did you dial into the uh the cake um bake off shenanigans i did yeah i was i was thinking of entering because i know that we spoke about it and then i had a look at the rules and i was thinking oh she was quite a lot more involved like I, yeah they people had to do like live decorating and that's so much pressure. it was super intense <laughs> it really was it was really good though it was very good it must have been a, a difficult job to be judging judging those cakes it was it was awkward um, because um you were kind of in like this weird zoom green room and then you got brought in at the like right time to to say something but yeah yeah it was just it was very surreal it's really surreal um, <laughs> but i'm looking forward to hearing about your experiences in copenhagen and i'd love it um to hear you talking come back and do some talks and events about how you've kind of you know gone to a new city and um discovered what the content sort of landscapes like and how you've kind of started working within you know even like just I think like I really admire people that go to a foreign city and start working there in a completely you know new environment because it's really exciting but at the same time it's quite you know it's quite a intimidating thing to do so I kind of I really admire you for doing that I think it's really amazing so yeah I really want you to like document those experiences and share them with yeah us. yeah i totally will do yeah it, it, yeah i mean it definitely is a daunting thing and it feels so much weirder with all the covid stuff because it just yeah. feels like it's never gonna happen and actually one of my neighbors i've found um, like neighbors of my new place i found by chance on twitter and every now and then he'll send me a, um, a message and be like oh it, it's really good here like he, it's someone um, on twitter who lives in like the same kind of like building like the same kind of block as me oh, oh, wow. it's a really good community vibe here and all sorts of things like this oh I just want to be there I just want to get there that's now. so lovely and it's so it's nice really these nice. days that you can like meet people virtually before you meet them in real life and you feel like you know them before you're even there that must be really it's hard. so strange I, I think I can't remember I think it might have even been um Lauren Curry who, who we both know and have been to workshops of who who is like the mutual person between me and him I think and I oh. I saw this tweet of him like working and I was like that looks looks really it look where he's working in this kind of little roof house looks exactly like where I'm moving to so I sent him a message and I was like is this where you live we're gonna be neighbors 
and now he's really nice he keeps like dming me like he sent me a picture of my mailbox like <laughs> you have like you have your name on your mailbox outside your house and he sent me a picture of it like your mailbox is ready for you oh wow <laughs> he's that's so nice, nice. If, if matthias if you see this thank you very much <laughs> it cheers me up a lot um so yeah so it's it's nice to know that there are yeah there's a good community of people already over there and then yeah in like I say in the UX the UX community is really nice and um, mm. I found some Copenhagen based people at Confab as well which I think was one of the a really good thing about it being virtual this year because yeah. it, I, I don't know about you but I know that I um, I could be quite introverted at like big events and things like that but with having the Slack community that we had for the, the conference this year it was really easy to like talk to anyone so I got talking to a few people from Copenhagen there and everyone was just so friendly and welcoming and you know let us know if you have any questions and stuff like that so that's yeah, so nice. exciting yeah there's definitely been some benefits to things being virtual this year I think you know yeah. more probably more conversations start online than they would do in real life when we're all kind of like a little bit nervous and you know don't want yeah. to go and talk to big groups of people so I think that's been one of the benefits and I, I kind of hope we don't lose that as a community and we can sort of keep that going yeah although I don't know about you but um I was kind of doing like the US timings like kind of staying up late for it and starting it and I got so tired I, that week it was just I couldn't I couldn't do the <laughs> late nights no I got to I just I probably could have done if I didn't have kids, but I was neglecting them by about six, seven in the evening. So I need to go and like see what they're up to. Yeah. Burning the house down in the background. Yeah, well, that, that's not conducive. Hello. Well, thank you so much, Amy. It's been really lovely talking to you. And yeah, thank you for having me. We're all very much looking forward to hearing about your adventures. So do you come back and let us know. Thanks. Yeah, I will do. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's great to speak to you. Yeah, and I'll speak to you soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye.